The question number seven is what is work function? What is work function? Work function by definition, by definition, it is a minimum amount of energy required to remove an electron from the photo metal surface. By definition, the minimum amount of the energy required required to remove the electron from the photo metal surface. So, from a photo surf, photo metal surface, if a photo if an electron has to be removed here you now the amount of energy required to separate the electron from the metal surface is being called as the work function by definition work function is now given by the formula omega naught will be equal to h nu naught omega naught will be equal to h nu naught where h is called Planck's constant and nu naught is a threshold frequency h is called Planck's constant given by 6.62 into 10 to the power of minus 34 joule seconds 6.62 10 to the power of minus 34 joule seconds and nu naught is a threshold frequency threshold frequency by definition what is the meaning of threshold frequency threshold frequency is a frequency of the minimum frequency of the instant line to emit an electron from the photo metal surface so therefore when the photons are made to instant on the photo metal surface all the photons may not be succeeding in producing the electrons but these photons should have a minimum frequency called as what on threshold frequency if the photon frequency less than that one it cannot emit the photo electrons the minimum frequency of the the minimum frequency of the instant photon is being called as threshold frequency now Frequency in terms of since we know frequency will be equal to even C by lambda I can call as lambda naught call as threshold wavelength even work function will be equal to h nu naught the threshold frequency h is Planck's constant and nu naught is replaced by C by lambda therefore h by h c by lambda naught here lambda naught is called the threshold wavelength that is the maximum wavelength of the instant photon beyond which there is no photoelectric emission so therefore Threshold frequency is a minimum frequency and threshold wavelength is a maximum wavelength at which we are going to get the photoelectric emission. The minimum energy required to remove the electron from the photo metal surface is being called as work function. question number 8 it's a problem given the question let us see the question once an electron an alpha particle and a proton having same amount of the kinetic energy so the first one will be the electron first one is electron next is alpha particle alpha particle and the third one is a proton third one is a proton therefore these three are the particles which are having same amount of energy same amount of energy now among them the shortest wavelength shortest de Broglie's wavelength will be among all these three particles among all these three particles or which of the particle will have the shortest de Broglie's wavelength let us start from the first de Broglie's wavelength the concept itself the de Broglie's wavelength is now given by the formula lambda will be equal to h by mv or you can write h by p h by p the de Broglie's wavelength is now given by the formula lambda will be equal to h by p or even h by mv. Here p stands for the momentum 
and uh, mv stands for the also momentum in which m is the mass of the particle and v is the velocity of the particle by definition if a particle having a mass m and having a velocity v velocity v then that particle also can be considered as a wave whose wavelength is given by the formula lambda is equal to h by mv according to the de broglie's concept so now we have to calculate the wavelength of these three particles called as electron alpha particle and even proton electron alpha particle and even proton for these three particles wavelength let us calculate and we confirm which one will be having the shortest wavelength shortest de broglie's wavelength so that we have to calculate now from dynamics we know the energy of a particle is now given by the formula it is half m into v square called as kinetic energy the kinetic energy of a moving particle is given by the formula e is equal to it is half m v square where m is mass and v is a velocity m is mass v is a velocity if i want to express the same formula in terms of momentum this can be now replaced as p square by 2m this can be now replaced by the formula p square by 2m so therefore kinetic energy of the particle is now given by the formula e is equal to p square by 2m in which p is momentum and m is mass let us correlate the first and the last term given by e is equals to it is p square by 2m hence p square now will be equal to 2m into e or p will be equal to under root of 2me p will be equal to under root of 2me now using the momentum concept what we did we have expressed the momentum in terms of kinetic energy because that is common for all the three particles that is common for all the three particles now after knowing this one after knowing this one let us substitute the value of momentum in the de broglie's concept now then when we go back here now de broglie's wavelength is now given by lambda will be equal to h by p p is now replaced by under root of 2 me p is now replaced by the formula under root of 2 me now your de broglie's wavelength will contains given by the formula h by under root of 2 me in which m is mass and e is energy and h is planck's constant since h is constant planck's constant even kinetic energy is also constant for all the three particles now your wavelength purely will depends upon the mass purely depends upon the mass therefore now from the above expression we can write lambda is now proportional to 1 by under root of m lambda is now proportional to 1 by under root of m in which purely wavelength of de broglie's wavelength will depends upon the mass of the particle not on the charge of the particle so therefore now if you see the electron alpha particle and even proton when we compare electron and even proton mass of the electron is less than mass of the proton mass of the electron will be less than mass of the proton and its mass will be as we know 9.1 10 power minus 31 and this value will be 1.66 into 10 power minus 27 kg kg therefore when you compare we can say that mass of electron is much lesser than mass of the proton and mass of the proton is less than mass of the alpha particle because for alpha particle we can write the configurations he24 mass will be four times so therefore this is mass of the alpha particle so mass of electron is less than mass of proton mass of proton is less than mass of alpha particle once we know the relation now we'll make use of relation for the lambda since lambda and m are inversely proportional lambda for electron will be more than the lambda of the alpha particle because mass of the electron is less since mass and lambda are inversely proportional mass and lambda are inversely proportional smaller mass larger wavelength larger mass smaller wavelength hence i can write lambda of the electron is now greater than lambda of the electron is now greater than lambda of proton lambda of proton and that will be greater than lambda of the alpha particle lambda of the alpha particle now is asking which one of these three elements electron alpha particle and even proton will have the shortest wavelength so therefore from the comparison we can say yes alpha so therefore lambda of alpha particle of alpha particle is shorter than the remaining two particles shorter than remaining two particles so this was a conclusion he was expecting in the given
in the question number 9 says that draw the circuit symbols of the pnp and npn transistor as we know there are two types of transistors pnp transistor and npn transistor the first one will write the pnp transistor here p n p and the second one will be n p n n p n transistor the circuit symbols of these two transistors we'll see first we'll put down the diagram block diagrams in which first element is p type second element is n type third one is p type so p n p transistor the first one is called emitter second one is called base and third one is called the collector similarly if you see the block diagram of the npn transistor in which the first one is n type material second one is p type material n type material and even the first one is once again called as emitter and base and even this one is called as collector so therefore now when we see the after seeing the block diagrams if you want to plot the circuit symbols the circuit symbols will be drawn as shown here as shown here for npn as well as for pnp the horizontal one the base is being expressed as an horizontal line and the remaining two lines express one for the emitter and one for the collector one for the emitter and one for the collector even the same circuit symbol will be used even for the npn transistor the horizontal bar indicates the base and the remaining two will be the one is emitter and the other other one is collector say that there will be a wide gap between these two and wide gap between these two emitter base and even collector so middle one will be base in the both the case here the middle one will be base right and wherever the arrow is not there that will be called as a collector and wherever the arrow is in being called as emitter in the case of pnp transistor we'll see how this arrow symbol will be introduced you know always in a transistor let it be pnp transistor or even npn transistor let it be pnp transistor or even npn transistor emitter base junction will be forward bias emitter base junction will be forward bias and base collector junction will be reverse bias so when i have forward bias here now that is this will be given to positive and this will be given to negative all the majority charge carriers will jump towards the base the majority charge carriers are holes majority charge carriers are holes which means positive charges are moving towards the direction of the base positive charges are moving towards the base that itself is a direction of current direction of arrow direction of arrow since the positive charges are going towards this base therefore arrow will be going towards the base so therefore this is called emitter this is base and this one is called collector in the case of pnp transistor now when we go for npn transistor in the case of npn transistor once again emitter base junction will be forward bias to give a forward bias this will be made negative and this will be made positive this will be made negative and this will be made positive the majority charge carriers in the case of the emitter are electrons the majority charge carriers in the case of the uh, emitter are electrons therefore all the electrons will be jumping towards the base but direction of current will be given away from it therefore even arrow will be away from it so therefore if we can remember these points you know then very easily can put down the circuit symbol for the circuit symbol for the pnp transistor or even npn transistor without any confusion so therefore this will be emitter and this will be base and this will be collector so then broadly finally what we have to what we have to keep in mind in the case of pnp transistor in the case of pnp transistor arrow will be towards the base in the case of npn transistor arrow will be away from the base in the case of pnp arrow will be towards the base and in the case of npn transistor arrow will be away from the base so therefore like that we can keep in mind about the circuit symbols for the pnp or even npn transistor
the question number 10 of the section a is says uh, what is modulation mention the basic methods of modulation so therefore to understand the concept of modulation let us take up the two important points now one is called signal message signal the other one is called carrier wave call as carrier carrier wave will be having high frequency and the message signal will be having the low frequency this message signal may be a textual message or maybe a photograph or maybe a video right that will be now sent to the other places so therefore that message signal generally will be in the lower frequency now we are going to combine message signal of lower frequency and carrier wave the one which is going to be now carry the signal to the various parts so therefore having a high frequency this process is being called as modulation the process of combining message signal at lower frequency with a carrier wave at higher frequency is being called as modulation is called as modulation now the types of modulations if you see here now the carrier wave the carrier wave is an electromagnetic wave expressed by the simple harmonic wave equation y is equals to a into it is sin of omega t plus phi y is equals to a into sin of omega t plus phi so in which this was actually expression for the carrier wave the carrier waves the a is called the amplitude a is called the amplitude and omega is called the angular frequency angular frequency or you can call angular velocity and phi is called the phase phi is called the phase so these are all the basic properties of the carrier wave which is used to carry the message signal now if the carrier's wave amplitude is being modulated according to the message signal called as amplitude amplitude modulation called as amplitude modulation what is that the amplitude of the carrier wave amplitude of the carrier wave if it is being modulated modified according to the message signal called as amplitude modulation next one if the frequency of the carrier wave is being modulated according to the message signal called as frequency called as frequency modulation frequency modulation similarly third one if the phase of the carrier wave is being phase of the carrier wave is being modulated according to the message signal then is being called as if the phase of the mod carrier wave phase of the carrier wave is being modulated according to the message signal called as phase modulation phase modulation so therefore there are three types of three modes of modulation one is called amplitude modulation frequency modulation and even called the phase modulation so with this all the vsqs of the section a are being completed